at 11 with Paula Francis and Dave Cravassier. The news of Southern Nevada is now. It's been 25 years to the day since a live interview with a shadowy guy named Dennis changed everything for America's most secret military base. Dennis turned out to be a Las Vegan named Bob Lazar, who claimed to work at a secret facility built into a mountainside just south of Area 51. The story started a UFO stampede that continues to this day. Lazar has tried to put the flying saucer stories behind him and has been discredited in the eyes of some critics, but it is a story that simply won't go away. We coaxed Lazar into talking about the last quarter century of UFO craziness. The I-Team's George Knapp has the story. What better way to unwind after a long day than a glass of Groom Lake red wine from the Ailey Inn? Maybe spend a few minutes staring at the paintings you picked up at the Area 51 art show while perhaps listening to the Bob Lazar music video. The story that Bob Lazar told 25 years ago this week has gone around the world many times over, inspiring books and TV shows and movies. Who knew that Indiana Jones Warehouse is at Area 51? That sound you hear means Agent Black will be waiting for you. You're too nice. <laughs> Another repository of Area 51 lore is the exhibit at the Atomic Testing Museum. While in town recently for our interview, <laughs> Lazar took the tour. I guess I have to get a picture of that, too. It was a little surreal watching Bob Lazar as he saw tape of the first interviews he ever gave about his time working at S-4. Later, as we plowed through boxes of paperwork about his claims, Lazar reiterated his preference that people don't believe his story. Look. I am not out there giving UFO lectures, producing tapes. I, this is not a business of mine. I am trying to run a scientific business. Um, and if I'm the UFO guy, it makes it really difficult. It's to my benefit that people don't believe the story. I'm These days, Lazar and his wife operate a scientific supply firm in Michigan. He's received media coverage because of the odd stuff he sells online, but not everyone has made the connection to Area 51 and the stampede he started back in 1989 when he told of working at S-4 south of Area 51, where he saw flying saucers so advanced they had to be from somewhere else. This is a model of the reality reactor, he says, was able to generate its own gravitational field, powered by what he called element 115. Barry turned on the reactor, which was a flat plate and half of a basketball, essentially, on it, just a uh, hemisphere. And once it was uh, activated, you could not touch the sphere. You put your, put your hand on it, and just like the uh, light poles of a magnet, the exact same type of force. He had a, a little golf ball and you know, we dropped it on it and, you know, it never hit the sphere and fell off and then, you know, you we threw it at it and it rebounded and knocked the ceiling knocked tile the ceiling out of place. Tile. But it was, uh, that, it, that alone is something amazing. Look, that can change everything we know today. The story exploded among it's UFO also, researchers you know, and just as quickly led to questions and denouncements. The I-team confirmed Lazar had previously worked at Los Alamos National Lab, but we also reported his claimed education credentials could not be proven. UFO experts, including physicist Stan Friedman, also dug into his background. I say, here's a bright guy. I did a lot of checking on him. I find a lot of things didn't check out. That doesn't mean I disagree with everything he ever said or that he was a liar all the time. It means that I can't buy the story as presented. What all he did out there, I don't know. Lazar says there's no end to the questions, and even if he could prove he worked at S4, someone would say he must have been the janitor. So he generally avoids the topic altogether. Oh, you just, do you want some of the fame? What the fame? You know, there's no big dump truck dropping money off at my house every Thursday night. There's no, I'm not out for any fame. I really have better things to do. Generally, people have to twist my arm to come out and do things like that. As you know, you're the arm twister. <laughs> Those who were around him at the time the story broke or took the trips into the desert to see the craft fly above S-4 say, you really had to be there. There's a MUFON moron that calls me every once in a while and he says, we don't still believe that guy, do you? And I say, I lived it. 
It, the whole two years, it was fantastic. It was one of the greatest times of my life. He wouldn't go through the trouble to make up a story to lie to people and then perpetuate that lie. Bob has no idea who won the Super Bowl in the World Series last year, do you? I mean, he's busy doing scientific stuff in, in the Bob Lazar world. He, he wouldn't waste his time perpetrating a lie on anyone. Look, I know what happened is true. There's no doubt, period. Lazar was known to have unconventional interests and a spotty financial record, so why would a top-secret program let him in? One theory is that maybe someone predicted he would spill the beans and was chosen because they wanted the UFO story to be planted. Lazar told us he can't rule that out entirely. We're putting together a special Area 51 section on our website, and we'll be adding material to it over the next few days, including extended excerpts with the most recent interview. And by the way... The Area 51 exhibit is having a grand reopening this Saturday. That alone is something amazing. Look, that can change everything we know today. Just having a machine to produce artificial gravity. Because look, look at what that does. We know gravity, space, and time are all tied together. There are your shields, like on Star Trek, that you know deflect micrometeorites. There is your protection from radiation without heavy shielding. There is something that with an intense enough focused field, you can actually bend space. And there is something that can actually alter the flow of time. I mean, that's the missing piece of pie. Didn't they actually freeze a, a, a candle? Flame, a flame for yeah, you. now that's when it was connected to the gravity amplifiers where they could focus it. And uh, that they, was... They froze a candle? A flame yeah, they, flame. Had a, they had a candle lit uh, to set it up for you. Um, again, there's a large, in the craft itself, there are three long pipes. Um, I'd say, uh, well, I don't know about what's that? It's three, four feet in diameter, maybe f five feet long. Um, anyway, they dangle the three of them at the bottom of the craft. These produce gravitational waves, and they can focus them to a point or spread them apart. Those um, are what you call the wave guides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're part of the. Uh, power source control mechanism and the uh, wave, well, the waveguide is what I actually call the interlink between okay. them, but that, that's the gravitational engine. Um, they had one of those devices out along with the subsystem that connects it. So they can produce the power from the reactor, it runs the gravity amplifier, and they can focus and change the gravity beam that comes out of it. They took, uh, they you know, Barry took a candle, put it close to the mouth of it, lit it, a normal flickering candle flame, and then activated the reactor. The gravity wave came out as expected, and the candle flame remained luminous and stopped moving. And Which I mean, physics, yeah, right? because the look, photons. if it's going to freeze it, the photons should stop being emitted. If it's going to you know, change the characteristics. Look, how can the combustion continue to take place without the convection inside the flame? Because actually, the reason a flame is elongated is not, not really because of heat, it's because of gravity. Because gravity pulls down and you know, convection moves flames upward. It's why in, in a zero gravity environment, flame is a ball. Obviously, there's nothing to pull things around. But anyway, if uh, look, if you negate the gravity around it, why is it still pointy? How can it still be making light? And why doesn't it move? Well, I mean, he, from what Barry said, it's not just gravity, but it's also time locked. You've they distorted froze a the frame of time. Yeah, they right? essentially froze a, a, a piece of time there. And I, you know, what do you say? I mean, you're it's empirical evidence. You're looking at it. It's, it's not. It's that not you a. Can see it. It doesn't make sense that you could see it. And uh, look, it, it, the stuff I saw there was the most unbelievable, literally, because it, it, it defied what, what we knew as physics. And uh, at least I thought it did. And maybe what we knew was <laughs> a little incorrect and just needed viewing from a different angle.